All right, everyone, let's get started. Thank you so much for coming here today um, to the talk on lessons from building a vaccine and company in three months. So quick thing, um, just so you know, for the Q&A portion, we have two microphones set up, set up on in the aisles. So if you have a question during that time, please just line up behind the microphone to ask your question and then we will alternate um, who asks questions, just so that's how that works. Um, but yeah, so this talk will be on a really cool new um, EA biotech startup that I actually had the opportunity to intern at over winter break, which was really phenomenal. So that is Alvia. Uh, Alvia is a new EA vaccination organization of drug developers, logistics experts, physicians, and operators working around the clock to develop and rigorously test a simple, scalable, and shelf-stable vaccine that is easy to adapt to new COVID-19 variants and pathogens. Our speaker, Ethan Alley, is the co-CEO of Alvia. He was formerly at the MIT Media Lab, and he has an, a Master of Science from MIT and a Bachelor of Arts in Integrative Biology and Computer Science from Harvard. Welcome, Ethan. Hello, everybody. OK, cool. The mic makes my voice echoey. Um, let's see. Hopefully I can... There we go. So I am from Alvia, as Miriam said. Uh, we got the chance to work together earlier this year. She designed a really cool uh, 3D printable inhaler for us, which was super fun. Um, and Alvia is a company whose goal is two part. It's to increase our ability to respond to global pandemics and to do that in a way which is itself more global, uh, which is able to serve people uh, uh, who are currently not getting access to vaccines and therapies uh, for infectious disease. So we are making a DNA delivery platform. You can think of it like uh, going up one level of meta from RNA. So instead of delivering a piece of RNA like Pfizer and Moderna, we deliver a piece of DNA, which then produces RNA inside of your cells. Uh, so just like RNA, because you're controlling the sequence, you can program it to be whatever you like. And a lot of the downstream steps, the vast majority, can stay exactly the same. That means that you can adapt it quickly in response to a new pandemic, a new variant of COVID, uh, or in our case, uh, if you're trying to build a company very quickly. And the reason why you'd prefer DNA to RNA, uh, well, there are a number, but a key one is that the DNA molecule itself has a higher intrinsic stability than RNA. So you may have heard early on in the pandemic about Pfizer and Moderna trying to get you know, freezer complexes together so they could store uh, the RNA vaccine as they were shipping it around. In low and middle income countries, freezer cold chain is a key limiter to the logistics of distribution. And so having a, a vaccine which is able to get the same programmability and adaptability of an RNA vaccine platform, but with uh, the robustness of DNA, which can sit out at room temperature for, for months, we expect, uh, seems like a key addition to the toolkit for pandemic preparedness and one which may reduce vaccine equity. Vaccine inequity, excuse me. <sighs> so, like I said before, we're targeting both neglected uh, users in the developing world and the people of the future who are in their own way neglected by existing vaccine paradigms. We see a history in, in biosecurity of reaction precipitated by an event like Ebola or an event like anthrax and then a die-off of interest pretty soon after. Uh, and we think this is not rational and that actually future people deserve to have platforms prepared in advance so that we're prepared to respond if there is a new pandemic, like my former PI, Kevin Esfeld, talked about this morning. It seems like this risk is increasing and we should be prepared. Um, interestingly, in our view, these problems dictate fairly similar requirements. If you imagine a, a catastrophic situation where supply chains are disrupted, logistics are disrupted, 
uh, healthcare capacity is strained substantially, it actually has many of the same requirements as rural areas in low and middle income countries who might not have that healthcare capacity, th that logistics capacity, uh, that supply chain to begin with. And so we actually believe there's, there's a strong synergy here and an opportunity to address both of these needs uh, with one platform. So I titled my talk Lessons from Three Months Here, and that means I'm supposed to tell you what we learned. Uh, what I didn't realize when I signed up for this, which was just a few days ago, uh, is this, which I saw in the conference email, I think Thursday at around midnight, and I was like, wait, what? And then I was like, wait, what? And then I was like, oh man, I have not thought about being a student since I dropped out, really? I've been focused on building this company and doing stuff, and it's just absolutely insane that both this many people are here and that there are so many people who are approaching their career uh, from an EA-motivated uh, perspective uh, for the first time. And that's super exciting to me, and I think the organizers probably deserve a round of applause for, for pulling that together. So I was thinking, what have we learned, and how am I supposed to uh, write the talk that I gave a title for? Uh, we learned some things. We learned some funny, weird things. We learned that uh, it costs $125,000 to pay a professional clinical trial randomization provider. Uh, what they do is they give you some random numbers to assign the patients in your trial arms to different arms of the trial, and it takes them eight weeks. Uh, I've learned all kinds of stuff that I didn't know I needed to know about Slack. We're a remote company, uh, which you know, means that each of these symbols has a deep, deep meaning. Uh, and I now know who to call if you ever need to get a sheep a tattoo. Uh, that's a long story, but I'm happy to tell it later. The thing that I haven't done is I haven't really thought about what it's like to approach a career from the perspective of a student or, or a person who's, who's kind of getting into things for the first time uh, in at least three months when I was at MIT and dropped out. And in general, I was feeling a little self-conscious about the fact that I haven't been thinking about big ideas or learning uh, important things which would be worth communicating here to, to as lessons, uh, as I stated in my talk. Um, and so this is often how it feels when I went through the, the list of all the random little tidbits that I learned. Um, but then I, I sat with it longer, and it started to feel like there were lots of things that we learned that were actually important, but were maybe a little bit less uh, legible and obvious. Uh, and I could tell that we learned something because we did something there's no way we could have expected to do when we set out. Uh, none of us had ever grown a company this quickly before. We now have over 40 people three months in. Uh, we had no experience with DNA delivery. As far as I know, nobody in the team does. Uh, and we'd never made a vaccine before. Uh, and so something had to happen to get between where we started and where we are now. And that thing is, obviously, we learned something. Uh, but we learned it in a very different way than I was learning things at MIT. Uh, I think it might be the biggest thing that we accomplished so far, is picking up all of the random things that a person needs to know to go through this process. Um, and I was thinking, it might be worth considering a hypothesis. I'm not sure if I fully believe this, but I, I think it might be important to think about which is that more people who are interested in having a positive impact in the world should stop thinking about there being this separate stage of learning and building career capital and gaining resources, and then finally the stage where they have their action in the world, and instead think about the process of doing these things together all at once, uh, which I have called learning by doing. Uh, I want to caveat that 
I'm primarily thinking about this from the perspective of somebody who's interested in my impact on the long-term future. That's not the only thing I'm interested in, but it seemed like the most interesting question uh, as it relates to learning by doing. I'm speculating here. I don't know what I'm talking about. And a lot of this is, is projecting my former flawed understanding of how you know, career advising and whatnot has worked historically in the EA community. Um, so all of this with grain of salt, but uh, I'm going to tell it to you anyway. So if you're not learning by doing, what are you doing? I think it looks something like this. Again, this is uh, an obvious caricature, and I think some ADK advisor somewhere is screaming as I present this. Um, but it's something like we think real hard, we decide on, on the most important problem, we learn all the skills, we learn the knowledge, we gather career capital and other resources that are necessary, and then sometime down the line, we finally get to, to have the impact that we were intending. Um, this is a caricature, but I think there's a real grain of truth in at least how I used to think about my career uh, when I was looking for the thing that I wanted to do. And I also think that in the long-termist community, this isn't just a career thing. There's a pattern that I see in the long-termist community more broadly, which has this characteristic of engaging with the real world kind of infrequently. There being only a few levers that people think about pulling related to giving money, writing papers, writing books, sharing ideas with the world, but not so much interacting with the world super frequently and with a very tight iteration cycle. And I worry about this because I think it's hard to do things if you don't see that data a lot. My experience of the last three months has looked more like this. It's looked like having some model of how the world works, immediately being told that I'm full of shit. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to curse, sorry. Um, <laughs> and just doing that over and over and over and over. And I think all of the Alvians in the room have seen me flail and fail and make one mistake after another with every aspect of what we're doing. Um, but when you sit with those mistakes and you keep trying and you keep bashing your head against the real world and trying to solve a problem, and importantly, you reflect on the mistakes that you make. I think that this is what generates the feeling I have that the last three months of work that we've done has actually had more learning value for me than the previous year and possibly even multiple years before that. Uh, during my PhD and when I was in the mode of learning and thinking and gathering you know, the strategy and, and the career capital. So what arguments favor this learning by doing weighted strategy? Um, I think that no matter where you end up, you're going to need to do this if you're doing any kind of hard problem uh, because no schooling, no professional training is going to perfectly prepare you for the role and, and responsibilities that you need to take on when you're doing the final thing. Uh, if you are in a situation where you're very uncertain about what strategy eventually makes sense, or if you notice that strategies are changing a lot, which I think is fairly accurate for describing a lot of long-termist thinking right now, then there's a higher risk that if you invested in one of those strategies, you'd eventually learn that you made a mistake. And so I think in that situation, uh, you should also consider learning by doing more. Likewise, and this is related to the previous point, you might be in a situation where there's less explicit knowledge written down in books that's relevant for what you want to do. I think this depends a lot by cause area and what strategy you think is most promising. Uh, but having less formal knowledge written down is again in favor of just trying to do the thing. And there's also a related thing where maybe you're in a domain where a lot of secrets exist, things that uh, you know, are written down somewhere but not in a place that you can find them easily. So this is our experience, of, at least my experience, of running a clinical trial where we'd sort of 
plot along, trying to do various steps in the process, and then we'd hit something like that randomization thing I told you, which was just mind-blowing, and that would not have been a thing that I could have found in advance. Uh, I personally have experienced lots of random additional tasks, which seem uh, auxiliary to the learning and growing as a person in my PhD. Lots of paperwork and bureaucracy. And one of the other things in favor of the learning by doing strategy is that you can uh, decide just to cut all that stuff out. And maybe, maybe it's faster, too. And if you feel like there's a sense of urgency in having the impact that you want to have on the world, that would point towards potentially doing a strategy that looks like this. But it's important maybe to distinguish, are you, are you talking about learning faster, or are you talking about doing faster? So I want to quickly give some context on what fast looks like in the context of Alvia. We started, as I said, three months ago on January 1st. Uh, we had a little hackathon before that, week before Christmas, and then we took a week off. And I think it was the Friday after the new year, uh, Chris Painter, who is in this room, coordinated the injection of our vaccine into the first animals, who happened to be three sheep named Meryl Sheep, Betty White, and one who I'm forgetting. Uh, that's our our Slack message celebrating our first animal dosed with a vaccine. And this is a vaccine targeting the original Omicron variant, BA1. Uh, we had set out to make this vaccine during the upswing of the Omicron wave, when it felt very, very urgent, and there was a lot of uncertainty about how severe the disease might be and how well boosters might protect you. Uh, Subsequently, just a few weeks later, there was a new variant that people started talking about. And our COO, Kate Hall, posted in our Slack channel called Change My View, saying, we should switch to this, guys. And I still am very amused when I think about the fact that this caused us to completely pivot our strategy after we'd already started planning both a clinical trial and uh, a substantial amount of experimental work on our original uh, Omicron vaccine. And so this was just three weeks in, and we'd already learned a lot about Omicron epidemiology and the fact that there is a variant that some people were talking about uh, and you know, is more prevalent in the news now than it was at the time. Uh, just two weeks later, we again dosed some sheep. I think all of those sheep also have names, but there are 18 of them, and so I'm not going to state them. <laughs> Uh, we also, I believe, were the first to announce the vaccination of any animal with a BA2-optimized BA2 vaccine, uh, including all of the big players. Now, of course, somebody may have uh, done this and not publicized it. We don't know that. But at the time, we could not find anything when we searched hard. Just a few weeks after that, or actually it looks like about one week after that, um, we decided that we were going to put this BA2 optimized vaccine candidate into a clinical trial in South Africa. None of us had ever submitted a clinical trial in South Africa. Uh, and maybe none of us had submitted any vaccine clinical trial. Is that right, Max? No vaccine clinical trial. Yeah, so that was new too. Uh, just one month later, four weeks later, we successfully submitted 10 minutes before midnight on the date that we set out as our goal, March 18th. I shook a champagne bottle and spilled it on my computer and <laughs> thought that it was the end, but it made it through. Uh, and this is as close as I could find to the announcement because we actually celebrated it on a video chat, so y'all are gonna have to miss out on, on the pure joy of that moment. Uh, some of you might be wondering, all of this is well and good, but what the heck are you talking about a vaccine that you haven't shown any data for suggesting 
it works. So we designed this vaccine to use components that were as simple and straightforward and well-validated as possible. And our intention was that we could find such a set of components uh, that was so robust that it might just work on the first time. And preliminary evidence looking at neutralizing antibodies in mice suggests that it does work. I'm not going to go through and explain this, except for if I can, OK, there we go. Uh, these ones are low. Those ones are higher. And this is later on. You'll notice here that some population of mice didn't respond very much. We think that this is because our vaccine is going into the skin. And if you're trying to inject into a mouse, they have very thin skin, and it's very hard to actually land it there. Uh, but this was literally the first design that we made. We wound up having to get some of the DNA of this design off of a random plasmid because it was the only thing that we could synthesize fast enough to stick with our goal. Um, and it worked, which was very fun. But we'd already moved on by the time that we got these results to our BA2 vaccine. Uh, our BA2 vaccine expresses in what are called tissue culture cells. These are human cells. This man right here both built the tissue culture facility and took these beautiful microscope pictures. The green you're seeing there is uh, a fluorescent tag uh, localized to expression of the spike protein for the BA2 variant. I'm probably getting some of the details wrong here, but luckily a lot of Alvians are in the room to correct me. Uh, we also found that this one worked. We found binding antibodies, which are on the left there. What you're looking at is the number of lines that are going up and versus not up. And you can see one green line down in the black cluster there. That's the one mouse who, for some reason, didn't respond to this. Um, and on the, on the right-hand side, we see, again, this neutralization number, which is measuring something closer to how protective we might expect it to be. And all of these are correlates of protection rather than some ground truth endpoint, uh, but they're fairly well established at this point. Yeah, so this is 11 of, of 12 of the, of the mice appear to have an immunity. Um, how are we doing on time? Good. Um, along the way, we learned lots of other things. Uh, Ryan, like I said, learned how to set up a tissue culture facility alongside Angela, who's sitting right next to him. Uh, we learned how to produce plasma DNA faster than gene was. I say learned, but I think it was mostly just, well, there was some learning, and then there was Brian Wang being an absolute beast uh, and doing, doing the experiment for you know, so many hours a day over the course of a few days in order to hit that two-week timeline. We learned how to write a trial protocol. This took two weeks versus the eight that we were quoted by the best CRO with the fastest timeline we could find after we bargained with them and begged for an even faster timeline. We learned how to run our own quality management system, which I had no idea about, but this was supposed to cost a crap load. And James Smith, who's sitting right there, managed to set up a super lightweight and uh, easy to work with version ourselves. We have since starting manufactured thousands of doses, which is also a thing that none of us had ever done before. Uh, this involved a great deal of begging and bargaining as well, except this time they were willing to do it a little bit faster. Uh, we've also learned a lot about building a company. I think we grew to 35 people in less than a month. That's what I said on my Twitter, so I'm hoping I wasn't lying at that point. Uh, this is very fast, I think, in, in the scheme of companies. And fingers crossed, we haven't exploded yet. Um, if anything, I feel better and better about our team and the direction that we're taking. But that took a lot of mistakes, too. Uh, finally, and this was very surprising to me, as we were sort of pulling all of our data together in the clinical trial application itself, I was watching some YouTube videos trying to get a sense of how we were supposed to write it. And there was one by the NIH. And this NIH video was like, after you have all the data together, you need to allocate six to nine months. I was like, what? And I looked, and they said it would take 
at least three months just to liaise between the departments that have the data that needs to go into the application, and then probably another six months after that to write the document. Uh, we were putting data into the document basically as it was going in, uh, and I think if you measure from the timeline where we got kind of the, the final core results, it was a matter of hours uh, or at most a couple days before we wrote the whole thing. Uh, it's not a fun time. I slept on a beanbag chair, but we did it, and we learned a whole bunch doing that too. Finally, um, it's pretty fun to be able to see the output of what you've learned. This is... This is a vial of Alvia Vax P1.2. Uh, it's basically the exact vial that will be used in our clinical trial. There's a slight difference, um, but I'm keeping it as a souvenir, and I'm hoping that when I look at it in a number of months, it is still basically in good shape, even though it'll probably spend a lot of time in my warm pocket. Uh, that's the, the shelf stability hope we have. So when should you not do this learning by doing strategy? There are obviously a ton of situations where this makes very little sense. I think if you're trying to do you know, theoretical AI safety work, probably you should be studying math somewhere or something. Um, but within the domain that I'm familiar with, again, weighted towards maybe biosecurity, catastrophic risks, um, the biggest thing that seems like a limiting factor here is that if you're learning by doing, making mistakes is actually going to have real world consequences. And so at Alvia, we tried to balance making as many mistakes as possible with having a very strong sense of when mistakes matter most. Uh, what we try to do is we try to identify each individual looks for whether a particular decision has a characteristic of being asymmetric, meaning if it went wrong, it could go a lot worse than it could go better, and irreversible in the sense of we can't easily do something after the fact to, to fix the situation. And I think that if you are careful in selecting the area that you're working in, the project that you're working in, and you have a very strong practice around this thing, then this consideration can be ameliorated so that it's possible to, to make those mistakes and learn from them. Uh, there's also, of course, the thing that we fell prey to a number of times where we were like, oh, this is easy. And then, you know, a few weeks later and having to go through this or that ridiculous CRO step, uh, learning that it's actually hard. And so this is a risk and something that needs to be kept in mind. I think this is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe another key thing is that in an environment that's focused on execution, I think it's pretty standard for organizations to wind up just optimizing for execution and not optimizing for, for growth and learning. Uh, but I think this can be fixed by prioritizing this as a team and, and as an organization. Uh, I think the deep expertise and credentials things are fairly obvious, but you know, depending on the context, uh, you'll have to look for other opportunities to build credentials, like doing really cool things that might not apply in some circumstances, but could be extra cool elsewhere. I think the final point is that there aren't a lot of places where you can go to get started with this learning by doing. I think as a community, we should invest more in setting up circumstances where people are able to mistakes, act, make mistakes actually trying to do the problem uh, that they care about, and in particular, making a work environment which is prioritizing learning and making time for it uh, instead of just focusing on execution. I'm curious if anybody wants to push back on these things uh, or add particular points that I'm missing there. Here's our team. They're amazing. Actually, can we have all the Albions stand up for just a second? These people are really cool and you should talk to them. Uh, 
I'd also like to take just 15 seconds of silence for the animals that uh, were sacrificed for these studies. And finally, thank you. Here are our funders, and here's some other things that you can read if you want. Thanks so much. So I think we're gonna do questions at the microphone. Is that right? Yeah, so please line up there. And I'm happy to talk about other stuff that. It, I didn't bring up as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much. The talk was really interesting, and this company looks like a pretty incredible effort. So, congratulations. Thanks. Um, I was curious about your approach to um, nucleal, nucleus delivery of the DNA. I understand that's one of the major challenges of doing a DNA-based vaccine, right. and how you guys think about that. Yeah, so um, one of the words that I emphasized about our platform was simplicity, and the current set of options for DNA delivery involve a bunch of complexities. So there's electroporation, where you're actually shocking uh, in order to temporarily cause pores to form, both in the nucleus and the cell membrane. There are lots of additives, including lipids, similar to the mRNA vaccines. We went with a strategy as novices, uh, which was focused on doing the simplest version of all of those things. And so our vaccine is just DNA. And the way that we get into cells is we give more of it, and it's very safe. And so this is uh, not a problem from a safety perspective. We also target the skin for reasons related to uh, the immune cells that are present in the skin that aren't present elsewhere. So the answer is there's nothing special. We just rely on the random events that cause it to get inside the nucleus. And, and that works also, oh, that also works to get inside the nucleus as well as the cell itself? That's right, yeah. Oh, just two random events. Very cool, okay, thank you. Cheers. Uh, I think you all should probably line up while other people are talking too so that we can do a fast turnaround on question. Um, I was just interested in what are your like future ideas beyond the COVID vaccine yeah. for this kind of DNA technology for other vaccines in developing countries or gene like simple cheap gene therapy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, I was instructed by my co-CEO who handles all of the legal things <laughs> that I'm not supposed to go wild and talk about all our fun ideas, uh, but the platform can deliver any gene, it can deliver you know, a medical RNA, a therapeutic RNA, it can deliver any protein, and there are exciting things to do both for pandemic preparedness and for uh, decreasing the cost of expensive biologic drugs in low and middle income countries. That's a not, not a very satisfying answer, but hopefully you can stay tuned and there will be some more stuff coming soon. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, um, curious why everything was so screwed up before, right? For a small team to be able to make so much progress so quickly, um, I guess either in terms of people not doing DNA vaccines or um, with the randomization and, and CRO thing being so slow and expensive, like, you, do you think that's mainly due to like regulatory issues or, or are the existing companies just not very good and, and somebody could come in and, and compete and, and do better? Yeah. This is kind of still mysterious to me. I think there are multiple things going on. I think the largest one is incentive related. Uh, there just isn't an incentive to do, you know, platform therapies designed for low and middle income countries in particular. Uh, and like the mRNA platforms that have delivered COVID vaccines so quickly, these were actually uh, adapted after the fact 
in both cases, I believe, BioNTech and Moderna originally started uh, with a cancer therapy in the case of BioNTech, and I think general gene therapy in the case of Moderna, and then had to sort of you know, pivot at the end. And so I think that this is the strongest reason, is that there just uh, isn't an incentive for these companies to develop things that are you know, geared towards fast response and geared towards global distribution. Uh, but there's sort of a second answer, which is the biopharmaceutical, or the corner of the biopharmaceutical industry that I've seen is stuck in a local optima, it looks like to me. Like, people have no incentive to go faster than eight weeks in the case of this randomization thing, because trials typically take so long that the decision-making parties would just not blink an eye at that sort of delay. Um, and so it's just a, it's a completely different regime to be in to care about speed at that level. Um, and yeah, I guess ultimately this is related to there not being typically a sort of time sensitivity to uh, you know, cancer therapies in the sense of like there's not a, a wave of COVID that needs to be gotten ahead of. Um, and then the incentives are pushing towards those things rather than the things that we're interested in. Thanks. Hi, I was just wondering like as you scaled up so quickly, like in terms of the team size, that was also scaling like pretty quickly. Yep. I was wondering what kind of learnings you had around like how to make sure the team was communicating efficiently when there were so many like probably pretty complex things to like get up to speed on about yep. the project um, and whether that like requires like or no, actually, that's the whole question, is, is what kind of things you learned there. Yeah, th there's a lot. And I mean, it's, it's in a state right now where it feels like kind of jumbled up and not super clear. Um, I'm working as we are approaching a larger team size and writing some of it down. People are looking at me. I know I'm slow. Um, an example is thinking about whether you want to have communications that need to be synchronized across the entire team like asking for something that needs to be completed by every single person versus allowing there to be kind of parallel threads of communication that only occasionally synchronize. I have a computer science background, and one of those is just actually faster as an algorithm. And so we prioritize in our communications uh, putting as little constraint on how people are deciding to execute on our top level goal so that people can decide, you know, what, what are the, the threads that we need to synchronize versus not? And we try to avoid uh, like top down, everybody needs to do this thing type synchronizations. That's just one example. Happy to talk more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, so two sorts of questions. So first is going off of the team question. Yeah. So how did you find good teammates? I happen to know good people. <laughs> That's not quite true. I mean, I, I knew good people, and then I asked the good people to tell me who, had, who they'd worked with directly, who was also good, and then I hired them, and then I asked them, and then I hired them, and I kept going. So it was iterative. Sorry? So it was iterative, you just. Yeah, I mean, I think there were like certain people who had very strong networks, especially in like professional, uh, high functioning organizations pretty distant from the nonprofit like impact oriented EA community type scene um, and I found that those that that seems like a very very underrated type of career capital is like actual you know hours working with people in a, in a context of high performance such that if you go into a new organization you know who is amazing and you can call them up and ask them to join. Importantly, in my experience, there's a big difference between knowing somebody by reputation or knowing somebody as a friend uh, and actually having directly worked together on a project. I think that this is just a big difference in how well the, the hiring goes, in particular because it's, um, it's about being able to, to know what the person will be able to slot into very quickly because you're, you're sort of able to talk about the details of what it's like to work with them as opposed to just a general sense of like, you know, are they a good fit for the company or something. All right, and my second question is, is more about the regulatory side of things. Yeah. So how have you approached the regulatory process so far? 
Uh, we hired good people, and we asked them to approach it for us, and one of them is right there, and you should talk to him. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, I, I'm told one more question. My question's kind of related to the last one, so maybe you'll point me to the same person. Um, but I've heard from some people that one of the biggest slowdowns behind the COVID vaccines and why they didn't come out maybe a little bit earlier yeah. is because of various regulatory limitations and um, slowness in various processes, say, by the FDA. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions or if you were able to uh, various changes to regulations or processes that you think could both improve speed uh, without sacrificing safety. Yeah, so I, I don't have a, a well-formed view about things that the regulators could do, but I'll point at something that we've done which feels like it's an important reason why we were able to move so quickly into submitting our phase one trial, and that is designing a therapy which has such a strong sort of prior body of evidence that the safety and you know, putative efficacy are quite strong to start with. And so this is pointing you know, not towards proprietary complex like patentable ideas, but instead towards the sort of simplest, dumbest, most well-validated things. And I think regulators are, well, in our experience so far, my sense has been that regulators are sensitive to uh, these types of arguments from the literature. They're like, actually, they care about how strong the prior evidence is, and they're going to be, you know, more willing to to work with you if you're if you're using components that are very well validated. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I think that's supposed to be it. Thank you so much.